Good morning, Bioneers. Morning. That's a phrase my wife um, likes to use when she's here. And unfortunately, she's not here today because she has a bad cold. So I am pinch hitting, and I hope you'll um, give me some leeway for improvising a bit as we go along. Um, I am here to introduce Dr. Mark Plotkin, who is a healer and a man whose uh, life journey I think you'll find that combines a great deal of what we are all interested in. Um, <clears throat> and also I want to say that Lori and I have been coming to the Bioneers conferences now for about 25 years. And <laughs> thank you, and it just gets better and bigger and more wonderful. So thank you, Kenny and Nina and everyone. Okay, so jumping right in. Um, two weeks ago, the world awoke to the very disappointing news that voters in Colombia had rejected uh, the peace treaty with FARC, a guerrilla group which had been fighting the people and the government for more than 50 years. During that time, tens of thousands of people died. The one-time leftist rebels had made common cause with drug traffickers, and Colombia became one of the most dangerous places in the world. Still, hammering out the treaty years in the making has helped turn the tide for Colombia. The mere prospect was rewarded with such anticipation that President Juan Manuel Santos was given the Nobel Pre Peace Prize two weeks ago. Yet a slight majority of Colombians voted against it. Like the Brexit vote, the results are a sobering lesson of just how wrong pollsters can be and voters too. Please God help us. <laughs> what can I say? The good news, however, is the peace treaty was the stepping stone for an incredibly exciting foundation that is being laid in Colombia. Less visual, less visual, but equally, import, equally important are agreements being signed that will not only preserve millions of acres in the Colombian Amazon basin from environmental degradation, but will help to protect the cultural integrity of the uncontacted tribes who live there. I have the pleasure this morning of introducing you to one of the pivotal figures in that achievement, um, Mark Plotkin, who you'll um, soon hear from. When Mark um, was a college dropout, he happened upon Professor Richard Schulte's night class in 1974 while working at Harvard at a Harvard museum. It was a turning point in Mark's life. Um, he made his way down to South America and became involved with indigenous people there, which he will explain and I will not trouble you with. So I would like very much to introduce you now to a man who with his wife uh, has for more than 40 years worked in the Amazon and his activities along with Liliana Madrigal, um, they created the Amazon Conservation Team, which has worked tirelessly in Colombia and elsewhere, um, and has taken the neglected and often um, destroyed lands and the danger of people being um, literally killed because of newcomers coming in, and they have been able to preserve more areas than I know virtually anyone else ever has. So please welcome a healer and a fantastic uniter, Dr. Mark Plotkin. Thank you all, thank you Bill. Thank you, Kenny and Nina.
Thanks to many friends and supporters in the audience that make my work possible. Thanks to my indigenous teachers who had the patience to keep instructing me for over three decades, and I'm still learning. Now I'm here this morning to tell you why ethnobotanists like myself don't read science fiction. This is not a picture of a spider. This is a picture of a fungus. It's my favorite fungus. It's called cordyceps. Cordyceps lives quiescent on the forest floor and waits for insects and arachnids to go past. Once they do that, the fungus attaches itself to the insect exoskeleton. Once it's done that, the fungus burns a hole in the insect exoskeleton. It then inserts itself inside the insect exoskeleton. It then proceeds to devour virtually all of the insect's non-vital organs. Once it's done that, the fungus invades the insect brain, eating only a part of the insect brain, causing the insect to climb to the top of the tallest tree in the forest. Once it does that, the fungus eats the rest of the insect brain, thereby causing the insect exoskeleton to split open, thereby allowing the fungus to release its spores 120 feet above the forest floor. This is why ethnobotanists do not read science fiction. <laughs> this fungus is a source of cyclosporin. This is an immunosuppressant that makes organ transplant surgery possible. Nature is a deep treasure chest of mysteries, and most of them still remain. As I said, I'm an ethnobotanist. I've been at this a long time. I've had the honor and privilege of working with Amazon peoples for over three decades, and as I said, I'm still learning. I'm here to tell you these people know these forests and these healing substances far better than we do and far better than we ever will. And here's a case in point. I was co-teaching a class in conservation and healing with the great trio shaman Amashina a few years ago in the Brazilian Amazon. I developed a terrible case of conjunctivitis, pink eye, and there was a physician taking our course, and I asked her if she had any meds, and she said, yeah, I've got some pills and some salve. If you take the stuff, you'll be better in four days. I turned to Amashina and said, what do you got? He gave me this cat in the canary smile and said, give me your machete. He walked over to a palm tree just a few meters away, scraped off the bark, peeled it, squeezed out the sap, dripped it into my eyes, and three hours later, my eyes had stopped itching, and the next morning I woke up and my infection was gone. <laughs> Who would you rather be treated by? <laughs> this is the magic frog, used by Indians on the Peru-Brazil border for healing and divination. I featured this in a TED talk I gave in Rio de Janeiro a year and a half ago, and when I finished my talk, I packed up my equipment and headed to Kwamalasamutu, our headquarters in the Northeast Amazon. I took out my computer and gave my TED talk in the local language to the shamans and apprentices you see here. I got to the magic frog slide, and the fellow to my right, Kamanya, YY shaman, said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We know that frog, we have it here, and we use it for healing and divination. And I said, no, you don't. This frog only lives in the Amazon 2,500 miles west of here. He said, oh, yeah, it lives in the canopy. You've never seen it. And I said, I've been working here for 33 years. Why did you never tell me? He said, you've been working here for 33 years. Why did you never ask me? <laughs> the point here being that as an ethnobotanist, I was sent to the jungle by Dr. Schultes to look for healing plants but we're still finding new things, new to us, old to them. This is the great shaman Natala. I worked with him for over a decade, and one day we took a, a break from collecting plants, and he went over to an anthill, stirred it up, and applied the ants to the inside of his elbows. They bit him, and he knocked them off. And I said, what's that for? He said, for my arthritis. And I said, but I asked you if you used anything besides plants for ailments. And he said, look, he said, you're a plant guy. Okay, and I don't mind teaching you a bit more about plants. You don't know anything about insects, and I'm not going to waste my time teaching you. <laughs> Here's a fungus collected by my colleague, Wade Davis, who I know has spoken at Bioneers in the past, a fellow student of Dr. Schulte's. This is actually a lichen. Okay, lichens are the cross-dressers of the biological world. They're kind of fungi, and they're kind of algae, and they form this unique combination. When Wade went to work with the Warani in the Ecuadorian Oriente, where Lynn Twist's organization worked, 
uh, the Warani told him that we use this lichen as a hallucinogen. Now, there's no hallucinogenic lichens known, but Wade wrote it down and published it in the Harvard Botanical Museum leaflets. Just a year ago, in Access and Evolve magazine, it gave the account of people who went back to the forest, found this lichen, looked it in the lab, and it's full of hallucinogenic compounds. Hallucinogens, like these magic mushrooms, in the hands of shamans are vegetal scalpels that they use to understand, diagnose, treat, and sometimes cure the human mind. And that is why they can sometimes do things that our own shamans cannot. However, they sometimes have different uses in our own hands because beta blockers, a multi, multi, multi million dollar class of drugs, came out of these magic mushrooms first found and used by the Mazatec Indians of southern Mexico. Unfortunately, none of the monies ever flowed back to the Indians or to Mexico. This is not an acceptable way of doing business. Shamanic medicine is based on two pillars, as is our own medicine. Our own medicine is based on chemistry, what's in the pills, and technologies, MRI, CAT scans, blood work, x-rays. And shamanic medicine is based on chemistry as well, what's in the plants, and the lichens, and the insects. It's also based on magic. Spirituality, the placebo effect, the invisible world, whatever you want to call it, it can't be explained through the prism of Western science and language. But sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it works when our own medicine falls flat. This is my mentor, Professor Schultes, on the scene of his greatest discovery, ayahuasca. Ayahuasca was discovered, discovered, as white men find things, uh, <laughs> like Columbus discovered America, same principle. But Schultes always paid his debt and gave thanks to the people who taught him. What you see to his right, our left, is the first shaman, Salvador Chindoy, who is the one who taught Schultes about ayahuasca. Schultes raced back to Harvard, published this in the Harvard Botanical Museum leaflets, where it was read by about 12 people, and nobody else for about 40 years. And all of a sudden, it's being argued in front of the Supreme Court, and you can buy it on the internet. This is revolutionizing the way we treat many diseases around the world. This is an ayahuasca master, one of the seven original ayahuasca tribes who taught Schultes the use of the sacred vine. I brought this man to meet a foundation official in Los Angeles to get some support to protect his rainforest and protect his culture. And the foundation official, who spoke pretty good Spanish, turned to the medicine man and said, you didn't go to medical school, did you? And the shaman said, no, I'm a medicine man. And the guy looked at him and said, well, then what can you know about healing? I, I still don't believe this. And the shaman looked at him and he smiled and he said, you know what? If you get an infection, go to a doctor. But many human afflictions are diseases of the heart, the mind, and the soul. Western medicine can't touch that. I heal it. So the most pristine rainforests of the world are in the Amazon basin, where I have the privilege to work. And the rainforest has not revealed all of her mysteries. Here is the greatest archaeological discovery of the 21st century, the lost city of the monkey god, searched for for 500 years, and found using LIDAR by Bill Benenson, who introduced me. But the wonder drugs of tomorrow are being turned into a wasteland today. With the felling of the forest, uncontrolled mining, the wonder drugs are being turned into smoke and nothing more. This is the most important image I'm going to show you. I took this in a single engine Cessna flying over the Xingu Reserve in southeastern Brazil in the state of Mato Grosso. 
At the top of the picture is where the Indians live. That's the reserve. The horizontal line running through the picture is the border of the reserve. It doesn't get any clearer anywhere in the world in any image you have ever seen about why indigenous culture in many cases has it right and we need to learn from them. <laughs> top of the picture. Top of the picture, 14 tribes in pristine rainforest. Bottom of the picture, white guys. <laughs> Top of the picture, biodiversity. Bottom of the picture, just a couple of skinny ass cows. <laughs> Top of the picture, carbon sequestered in the rainforest where it belongs. Bottom, carbon released in the atmosphere. In fact, we know that the number two driver of climate change is destruction of the world's forests. You want to fight climate change? Protect the forest. So let me take you to the Northeast Amazon, where I've been working for many decades, to the country of Suriname, formerly known as Dutch Guiana, one of the most pristine rainforest countries in the world, and to the village of Kwamalasamutu, which is the indigenous capital of the Northeast Amazon. The Trio Indians came to my organization, the Amazon Conservation Team, and said, we want title to our lands, and we went to the government, and they said, where's your map? And we didn't know what a map was. So now we know, and we want the Amazon Conservation Team to help us. And I said, we will help you. And they said, so you'll make a map for us. And I said, no. And they said, but we thought you said you were going to help us. And I said, we will help you. And they said, so you'll make a map. And I said, no, we won't make a map. You'll make the map. We train them to map their own lands. And what you see here is the perfect marriage of ancient shamanic wisdom and 21st century technology. When we started 15 years ago, this is the best aerial imagery we could get. Each pixel is 30 meters across. Thanks to our partnership with Digital Globe, these Indians have access to the best aerial photography and imagery on the planet. A single pixel used to be 30 meters across. Today, it's 30 centimeters. We went from a third of a football field to a banana leaf. This gives the Indians the upper leg, the upper hand in dealing with the outside world on their own terms. So the original maps made by Westerners flying over these rainforests were blank, a few rivers. These maps show that these are rainforests full of wonder and meaning, and these people know them far better than we do. A single map can have a single icon on it, and when you click on the icon, it opens up with a story, a legend, or ecological information, or medicinal history. Our organization, the Amazon Conservation Team now, has now taken this methodology and partnered with 35 tribes to map, manage, and improve the protection of 80 million acres of ancestral rainforest. And as Tiffany said at the outset, we need to think about education starting with youth. We've taken these maps and turned them into textbooks. Schools in remote villages are usually built by missionaries. So the kids are learning all about cows, pigs, and Jesus. With these maps, they're learning about shamans and matriarchs and healing magic and legends and handicrafts. But we work from the inside out and the bottom up. We start with the indigenous cultures. We then move to the neighboring cultures. This is a Maroon from Suriname. They live north of these Indians in the Northeast Amazon. These are descendants of escaped slaves who got off the, rebel, got off the slave ships and said, Equatorial rainforest, see you white boys later. And they ran off in the interior where these warriors maintain independent lifestyles to the current day. And we've sent in our indigenous cartographers to teach the Maroons how to preserve their oral history, their culture, and their rainforests as well. And we've done this now throughout South America so that the Indians are working with the Maroons, the Afro, other Afro-Americans, the Campesinos, the peasants, the Caboclos, the Brazilian peasants, and the governments as well. 
Good conservation is about building alliances and bridges and bringing people together to make a better common tomorrow. I want to take you to the most important protected area in northwestern South America, land of the Kogis, the so-called Dalai Lamas of South America, the most traditional peoples who live at the top of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. These are the most traditional people I have ever met. These are the people who came down from their mountain fastness. This is a Kogi village. If you went there 5,000 years ago, it would look exactly the same. 25 years ago, they came down from their glaciers and said, hey, what are you little brothers doing down there? Our glaciers are melting. And everybody said, ha, 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 look at those funny little white hats. Well, we didn't listen. We ignored the canaries in the coal mine talking about climate change. And using these types of Google flyovers, we can put the power of technology in their hands. This mountain is the ultimate rain and water source in northwestern South America. All of the major rivers come out of there. And the Kogis protect these forests, protect these glaciers, and go down to the ocean, the source of all life in their cosmology, to protect their sacred sites, the spites you see here, and do it now in partnership with our work. This is Liliana Madrigal, our, our co-founder, sitting with a political leader of the Kogi, Santo Sauna, to plot the future together. And they are always making pilgrimage from the sea to the mountaintop to provide offerings to the gods, to make it down to the sea to collect seashells, to crush, to chew with their coca, which is their sacred plant, which releases the alkaloids. And they're now doing it with tablets, with mapping apps, and with smartphones perfect marriage of ancient shamanic wisdom and 21st century technology. Kenny talked about how it's all connected. Here it's mapped. They're mapping spiritual connections that we can't see because we're not Kogis and they're using technology to do it. So I want to finish by going to Chiribiquete National Park in the Colombian Amazon, which is the most important protected area in South America. Chiribiquete was first explored by my mentor Schultes in 1943. He found a wonderland of biodiversity and sacred sites. So just like with the Kogis, we need to protect these sacred sites and the biodiversity and the artwork. Schultes found the richest repository of pre-Columbian art ever discovered. There's 200,000 paintings. There may be as many as 900,000. And something else, isolated and uncontacted tribes. Isolated and uncontacted tribes hold a mystical role in our imagination. These are the people who know nature best. These people who are truly a part of the ecosystem. These are the people that embody the secrets of the rainforest and know it far better than any one of us ever will. Unfortunately, these people are under threat. This is the most threatened species in the Amazon rainforest, isolated and uncontacted people, surrounded on all sides by loggers and miners and uh, narco-traffickers. These are Mashkopiro who stumbled out of the jungle seeking help because they were being shot at and their malocas were being burned. Chiribiquete, fortunately, is now twice the size of what it was, thanks to our work and with Colombian colleagues, to protect the isolated and uncontacted peoples who, thanks to President Santos's bold leadership, now have protection they never enjoyed before. There are at least three isolated tribes living within the boundary of this protected area, and we suspect there may be as many as 14. Now, if this picture, in conclusion, looks a little out of focus, it's because it was obviously taken in a hurry. <laughs> Why don't you flow, fly low and slow over isolated Indian villages? Now this looks like it was taken in a hangar in the Brazilian Amazon. This is an art exhibit in Havana, Cuba. Their perception of why you don't fly low and slow over isolated Indian villages. 
So let me conclude on a note of hope. We're building guard posts to keep the outside world at bay. No miners, no loggers, no missionaries. We're manning that post with the Colombian National Park Service and local indigenous peoples. Here, the Witoto tribe to the south of Chiribiketi are mapping their lands using our methodology to keep the outsiders out and protect their isolated and uncontacted brothers and sisters safe. And we've created an indigenous park art force to protect these rainforests, these plants, these animals, these lichens, these healing, magical mysteries. So, in conclusion, the question is, what's the fate of these people? Shamans say it's all interconnected. I believe, and I know I'm not the only one here who believes this, that it's all interconnected. Their fate is our fate. We're pioneers. That's better than pioneers, because we don't leave environmental destruction and cultural, gen cultural genocide in our wake. So as pioneers, let's blaze a trail to a world in which indigenous peoples map, manage, and protect their lands. Let's blaze a trail to a world in which climate changes for the better, not the worse. And let's blaze a trail to a world where these shamans live in luxuriant forests and cure themselves and us with their magical plants their hallucinogenic lichens, and their sacred frogs. Thank you very much.